John Rezob is the founder and chairman of Social Bakers. He's the reason why we're all here. He has built one of the world's largest social analytic firms, helping marketers become more hashtag data driven and has been nominated twice under Forbes 30 under 30 list. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Jan Reza. Morning, everyone. Salamat pagi. So, um, before we get started, uh, thank you, Yuval, by the way. Thank you. You didn't have an ending there, so thanks for that. <laughs> really, uh, one thing that though that you didn't listen to Yuval at the beginning. Uh, we have over 300 people in the room, and I just took a look at the live stream statistics, and you guys didn't share that video. So before I get started, everyone, everyone now, take out your phones, go to the social baker, go to Facebook, go to the Facebook app. If you still have Facebook, if you're not one of those cool people that just, I'm only on Instagram, so go to the Social Bakers page, just search it out, it'll be there. And scroll down to that live stream, and you can just simply do the share now. We can get, there's like 35 people watching now, come on guys. We can get a, we can jack that up to like a thousand right here, right now. Come on, help me out here. Easy, 1,000. If, if half of you do it, if most of you do it, even better. But if half of you do it, we'll be at a thousand in no time. Right, it's, oh, uh, uh, see, it's already going up. 50? Uh, it'll, it'll, well, let's watch that, okay? Come on, share it, all right? Just share and then just share now public. You don't even have to write a comment. Or share and say, Jan is very cool. All right. Social Bakers has the best product. Just suggestions. Uh, I'm buying this software tool tonight. All right. So, sorry, <clears throat> just to get started. Um, it's great to be here. Um, Bali's such a great place to make a conference. Thank you for the <clears throat> team and for Telcom Cell for making this happen. It wouldn't happen without, without our sponsors, so thank you uh, to Telcom Cell and, and the team. Um, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good year for social bakers. Not only do we have so many products and so many launches out there. It's actually our 10th uh, anniversary as a company. And this is, uh, I'm really proud uh, to have founded the company and I'm really proud of our team to have taken it this far. So thank you and thank you for the team members and for those that will be watching and are watching back in our offices around the world. Um, for us, I, I suggest one thing before we dive into the details. Uh, I'm gonna have a lot of data in the presentation. So if you take out your notes and start writing, writing some things down. There, there are a lot of data points. It's one of the most data-packed presentations we've ever done. It's also almost an experiment in terms of how much data can you actually process. We're going to be sharing it with media. We're going to be sharing the presentations later. But it's the first time we've actually ever published these data points. So uh, very happy about that. One thing that probably everybody's been thinking about in the last sort of six weeks uh, was Mark Zuckerberg very early in the year has announced that they're going to do big changes in the newsfeed. Now I've heard marketers talk about this so much. It's like, okay, is this the end of Facebook pages? Is this the end of organic on Facebook? Organic for, on Facebook for brands has sort of already ended a while back, but it, it's, it's not. And, you know, one thing, when, when these announcements happen, it's really important to monitor the data. So not to go away and panic, but look at the data. Look at the data from your market, look at your data, and see what context there is. And we did that. Uh, we did exactly that. And if you haven't read Mark's note, it basically said that there will be a lot less companies and pages in the newsfeed. And there will actually be a lot more uh, of your friends. But of course, brands and companies and media have learned how to create better and better content. That's why they appear in the newsfeed so much. And then he later went on and the Facebook teams clarified, okay, this is not going to have an impact on paid. Uh, so paid, if you boost a post, if you put it out there, it's still going to be there. 
and so there's absolutely no change there. But it's interesting what the market did after that. Now, we're assuming most of these changes are actually not implemented. And this is not the first or the last newsfeed change that Facebook will ever do. They'll keep evolving it. And if they're smart, they actually uh, will keep changing it constantly. If, in fact, Facebook would stop to optimize the newsfeed, then the social networks would kind of die out. They have to do this. And we looked at the data. And uh, it's really interesting. So when we looked at the total engagement of the entire market, the data does go a little bit down. And then we're like, OK, so did he remove organic reach? What happened? You know, so we dug deeper. Because at Social Bakers, you all mentioned this really nicely, we have a lot of data. We are monitoring millions of Facebook pages, Instagram pages. Uh, we have uh, the insights tokens, the private data that we then can aggregate from over 500,000 pages. In some markets, that's like more than half the actual market. So we can do very accurate, as accurate data as it gets. So what happened? So brands started promoting a lot less right after the announcement. Some of this blurb, I don't understand that. They're like panicking. But they started promoting immediately a lot less. So marketers, after this announcement, first of all, this also could attribute to some level of seasonality. But Facebook spend has mostly been going up. But we see a couple reasons for this. Of course, there's a certain shift in marketing budgets to Instagram. I'm going to talk about that in a bit. But also, this is just pure behavior, right? This is not what the market did. What, what that creates is actually an opportunity. So what this means is Facebook ads will be a little bit cheaper for the general group, and the newsfeed will be a little bit less cluttered, which is kind of what Mark Zuckerberg wanted in the first place, which is kind of funny. He achieved that even just with the announcement. But you know, how come? Like, we wanted to go a little bit further. So we said, oh, well, how is organic doing, actually? So organic for brands, this is for brands of Facebook pages, has gone a little bit down. Now, again, we thought, you know, why is this? So we noticed that actually brands started posting in January a little bit less. So, and that, combined with a little bit of change in daily active users, where, which Facebook reported in their quarterly earnings, could actually attribute for that whole, uh, whole lot. But the paid bit is, is quite dramatic. So if we look at the paid, average paid reach, it jumped down uh, a lot. It has declined significantly. So again, if you're a marketer making decisions, what, what, what this tells you doesn't mean you should advertise less on Facebook. It means, in fact, on the contrary, most brands need to still double up on their social media investments. And, but it means be smart about it. And definitely don't panic. Uh, the, the second Mark Zuckerberg posts something on his Facebook page. If you have a really good strategy and if you keep adapting it with data, then this shouldn't shock you and absolutely should not come as a surprise to anyone. And again, there will be more and more of these changes. And marketers just panic. You know, it's, it's the thing they do when they see big announcements like that. And it's obviously natural, but I think the, that the smarter marketers that use a lot of data, uh, they shouldn't uh, panic. And of course, on the, on the second side, Facebook kind of needs the revenue. So they will definitely not be turning off the, the paid reach anytime, anytime soon. <clears throat> and maybe some tips here. So Facebook did say, all right, we're going to focus more on meaningful engagement. So what is meaningful engagement? So brands and media that, that will have meaningful engagement will get there. Now, of course, having monitor, being monitoring quite a lot of the, the network out there, we looked at, uh, at a lot of factors. Now, if you haven't read this article, r write this down and, and Google this article right later. Uh, it's a journalist, Katie, from New York, who terrorized her friends. She made a really bad real estate video and posted it on her Facebook. Now, friends commented, like, what, what, what is this? What is this, right? And, and she asked some friends on day two to you know, bring it back up there and keep commenting. Now, because some of them did it you know, artificially, then more of them say, why is this on my newsfeed on day two? And then day three, people, again, she did it. And then it showed up again. And people started being really mad. And that's when the Facebook algorithm started really placing that video higher and higher. She, she left it there for 14 days. 14 days, she managed to be, keep a piece of content on the top of almost every one of her friends' newsfeeds. Now, I don't recommend brands to terrorize their their users. That wouldn't be the best strategy. But it shows for what 
Facebook accounts for as meaningful engagement. Comments are definitely a bigger part of it. We know that it's longer comments. We know that uh, you know, kind of sentiment of that comment does matter. And we know, of course, if people share it, it's, it's almost logical and natural. But we also looked at comments like, where, where, do, where, do, these, where do these happen? A huge majority of the comments happen at, at the 5%, top 5% of the pages that generate this debate, that generate this you know, part of the meaningful engagement. And this is important to understand. Uh, most brands, when we look at it, actually don't have generate a lot of that. So when you're creating content, the, the thing that I would suggest adapting is create content that can bring up a conversation. Uh, usually that's video content, or as you've all suggested correctly, live content. Live content generates by far the most engagement, uh, most comments of all the content types on Facebook. So a couple of recommendations sort of how to stay on top of the newsfeed. As I mentioned now, live, post types. Keep innovating, keep testing post types. If, if we are recommending do live video, that doesn't mean every single piece of content on your page should be a live video from now on. You have to iterate, you have to try. You have to be smart about what content you post. Of course, advertising. Now more than ever, it's really important to choose your audience right and do advertising in a very, very smart way. And of course, as, as I mentioned, content that engages maybe a little bit more. And, and of course, th these were, this was largely about Facebook for now, but you know, do a little bit more Instagram. There's more, more and more of an audience there. So to get to other social networks, Facebook, of course, we always focusing on it because it's by far the most dominant platform. And it, it, it really generates, it generates a, a, a lot of the market share. But more and more so, we're seeing Instagram take over on, on a lot of factors. People spending more and more time on Instagram. I think it's going to be the next platform to reach 1 billion monthly active users. In fact, it's the first time that Facebook's not announced their community update. I think they were just waiting for the 1 billion user announcement. So I think we can expect that any week, any month now, that Instagram will pass a billion users. But it also has a, a, a lot more of this user engagement. This is what kind of Facebook wants on its Facebook, but it's kind of shifting to Instagram. And also, more and more so, and this comes back to the ad format, Facebook has, in Q4, launched in their Messenger app, they've launched uh, ads and ads placements. They did it in a quite clever way, and they put it up there. Immediately, on all the sample size that we have, 4 to 5% of these ads started becoming, all ads on Facebook, started becoming Messenger ads. Now, 4 and 5%, you might think this is a low number, but that equates in 2017, that would mean 1 billion in revenue. And in 2018, that could mean all the way to 2 billion. And of course, that percentage can grow over the course of the year. So even 4 to 5% for Facebook means that they just created a, a multi-billion dollar ad format just by releasing it. And, and while this might seem insignificant, this is the share and probably one of the most interesting charts that, that we have not yet published data point. If we look at one year of data, this is the advertisers that have advertised both on Facebook and Instagram. The share of Instagram ads goes from less than 10% up to 25%. This is median. If we actually look at averages, we get up to 40%. So 40, 60. 60% on Facebook, 40% on Instagram. This is, it's a subtle, but perhaps one of the most dramatic shifts on social media. What this could mean is a majority of advertising in the next six to nine months of social advertising will be happening on Instagram. I want that to sink in, right? This, this is huge. This is a multi, multi-billion dollar shift. And the money usually follows the users. So while we don't have that exact data on users and time spent you know, as, at a granular level as we could, this does follow those users. And, and Facebook and Instagram are different. So this is actually proportionally, when we look at all brands, what category is the engagement happening in? So on Facebook, we see e-commerce, we see e retail, services, fashion, and beauty. On Instagram, this is very different. It's visual content. So fashion, beauty, and auto are the top three categories on Instagram. Again, we're releasing this for the first time. So if you're 
going to tweet it or Instagram it or LinkedIn it, you're going to be cool. <laughs> and of course, another big thing happened during the last sort of 12 to 18 months, which is the stories format. Now, uh, Instagram conveniently copied that from Snapchat. In fact, very, very well done copy. Kudos to Facebook and Instagram for getting this done. And they stole away that audience very quickly. Uh, Instagram has already announced they have over 300 million users. This announcement comes from November. It's now five months later. We can probably anticipate that that number has now grown to 400 million or so monthly active users using stories. And um, this is a huge shift in how we prepare content. As users, we love those stories. It's kind of the new tweets. And as Twitter usage has been going down, I think that's what's replacing it. And of course, we went and we looked at the data. So this is another one of the data points we, we have. So we wanted to look at how brands do stories. And honestly, right now, the answer would be not too well. It's a beginning for them, and they're still learning the format. Why do I say that? An average story has about 7 to 8% reach of your Instagram audience. If we actually look at influencers or the top of the market, they get two to three times higher numbers. So when we, when we look at brands and they're performing at 8%, it's not very good. So then we went and looked at actually, OK, this has got to be different. So we looked at the top brands. We looked at just the segment that does really, really well. And those did 20 30% reach on their stories. In fact, there were some crazy brands that did 35 40%. And for some of those brands, 70% of their total Instagram reach came from stories. So they did a really amazing job in engaging that audience. But on average, if you summarize the impressions for brands today, stories are still a minority. And I see stories as two things. I see them as an amazing organic upside. So if you build that audience on Instagram, it's an amazing organic upside how to engage that audience. I see it as a great storytelling platform. And of course, because you can do paid on it, I can see some paid campaigns that you definitely could not do in the newsfeed. Now, there's been talk, will these stories replace the newsfeed? Will that be the new newsfeed? And from pulling all the data, I can you know, kind of say that that's not going to be the case. It's going to be in a great addition. And to, for some users, it's going to be the hardcore sort of thing they want to use. But for a majority, the newsfeed is going to probably here to stay. And you've all announced a, a, a great product that will enable brands to detect influencers and, and micro-influencers. And, and I think it's becoming one of the hottest topics. Um, we, uh, we actually have, have clients that are brands in Asia that invest not millions of dollars, uh, that invest tens of millions of dollars. It's almost 100 million for, for some of the brands yearly in influencer marketing. right? And, um, we know some of the biggest brands in the world globally, uh, that spend could be one or two billion for influencers. And I'm not talking about just the top, top, top line celebrities. I'm talking about the micro influencers and sort of scaling of their word uh, around the world regionally and with, of course, the big ones. So when we did look, and, and one thing, we were curious, how many of these, how many, you know, when we look at the celebrities, how much do they, do they actually work with brands? Right? Do they work with one brand? Do they work with five brands? And we got curious. So we pulled the data. And this is the same chart that, that Yuval was showing, just with the extra of this. There are some of the biggest ones work with 50 brands. 50 brands. Now, what does this tell you? That tells you two things. One is, if you're working with an influencer, do your due diligence on him. Is he working with 49 other brands? Guess how much of focus he'll have on you? Is he working with four other brands? And of course, I'd pay the most for people that don't work with any brands. So understand that there will be a premium for ones that are non-dilutive like that. And we look at the brands that are most mentioned. And of course, Spotify and Apple Music, I would kind of discount that a lot of the top, uh, top users are um, musicians are, are singers, so of course they're going to mention their Spotify account or Apple Music account. That's logical. But most of these are, are fashion or, or beauty brands. 
And this, this is just the top 10, but actually this is pretty consistent in the top 100. And many of these brands are actually uh, new brands. When we look at the top 100, many of these mega influencers created their own brands, created their own fashion or beauty lines. And, and this is a trend across the, world, across the glo globe. And I think it's going to hit local markets very, very soon. And there are also some pretty in, insane cases. Uh, these are three influencers kind of around the world. And some of these guys work with almost 200 brands. I mean, a year has 365 days. How, how can you post... <laughs> You know, majority of their posts were actually brand posts, right? And again, when you're kind of figuring out what you're going to do, you have to understand that. And our influencer product at that point comes at a great time. So you can look at that. You can understand, you know, not only is this influencer kind of engaging, but what his audience looks like. Do I have some level of affinity with this, with this guy? Um, and when we look at... Why is everyone laughing? I don't get the local reference. All right. So in, in, in Indonesia in particular, you can look that half of, the, of Asia's top influencers actually come from Indonesia. So this is a really, really good market for influencers. And you know, these guys work with brands a lot. 183 brands mentions, this is, this is a lot. Um, I, I, I need to ask about that reference later. I need to figure out what, what yeah, see. Um, should have shown that to a local guy before I presented it on a slide, shouldn't I? Yeah, that's a good presentation, fail, thank you. <laughs> All right, anyway, um, we also looked at uh, micro-influencers. So. What is the, sort of the share in the beauty category? You know, how big are these influencers? What is the share of mentions and in, when you distribute their following? So you can see that only a small percentage are, are the one million. But this shows you how big of a distribution, these small one to 10,000 followers. And if I would recommend one thing to, to brands, work with the smaller ones. Of, of course, to manage that is, is just insane. Like, it's really, really difficult. If you're thinking, I can control my brand message with influencers, forget it. My number one recommendation, in fact, in influencers is give them one or two or three conditions and let it go. Just, you know, kind of you're giving the brand to them a little bit and they're going to mix it and remix it. But if, if you want to be in that world, you got to you know, learn to let go of a certain brand aspects. The worst thing you can do is coming to the influencer and saying, okay, this is how we want you to say it. This is how we want you to talk about it. This is how we want you to compliment our product. Perfect. And give that to him. No, no, no. The best way to come to them is, this is our product. What do you think you could say about it? Well, how would you promote it to your audience? Because guess what? You might have all the insights in the world, but they can still promote your product better than you can promote your product because they know their audience the best. And this is why Social Bakers today uh, is unveiling the, the influencer product. I hope most of you will be signed up for the, for the beta program uh, later. Uh, we have an amazing set of speakers moving forward. I'm so proud we got them to fly in from all around the world. Uh, I'd like to thank you uh, for coming, thank the attendees for, for coming, and uh, I hope that we see each other soon. Thank you for listening.